Welcome to week five of Now Showing with Mike and Wayne, everybody. Uh, This week, our first topic will be X-Men, the entire X-Men franchise. It will be our first franchise spotlight uh, that we do. Um, Many people are probably like, why did you choose X-Men? You could have chosen a lot of other ones. I chose X-Men to be first because technically, even though people want to act like it never happened, X-Men was the first tentpole franchise to happen before Lord of the Rings, before Harry Potter, before Spider-Man, before the MCU, before the DCEU. So yeah, it was it was the first one that basically attempted to do everything, whether it did everything well. That's kind of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, but it was obviously successful as it ran for many, many movies and still technically has one more movie waiting to come out that's been kind of held up in uh, release hell because of COVID. So more than just COVID, though. Yeah, it <laughs> was it was more than COVID before. It when Disney bought Fox, New Mutants was uh, put on hold, um, and then actually Disney agreed to sh- release it as is without making all the changes that they, that Fox originally wanted. Uh, but then COVID got in the way and just kind of pushed yes. it back. Now they still think it's they still have it slated for the twenty eighth of, of August, but I doubt that's going to happen. Uh, but we'll see. Who knows? Yep. Um, so let's start off with, uh, we're going to start off with the first X-Men movie, which came out in 2000, directed by Brian Singer, yes. starring the lovely Holly Berry. She was basically kind of the, the actress that they assigned to kind of get the appeal for the franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, James Marsden as Cyclops. You had, uh, Famke Jansen as, uh, Jean Grey, but obviously the, the big one, uh, was the kind of, uh, introduction that we had to Hugh Jackman. As Hugh Jackman! Everybody's favorite uh, character from the 90s. Most people that I know that like X-Men, that's one of their favorite characters. It was never really one of mine until the movies. Uh, but yeah, he was a relatively unknown actor. He jumped into the role after Dougery Scott of Ever After fame and Mission Impossible 2 fame mm-hmm. as the villain. Uh, had to turn it down because of Mission Impossible 2. Bad decision on his part if you ask me <laughs> um anyone that's seen mission impossible 2 should understand yeah great franchise overall but yes oh great know, franchise overall mission impossible <laughs> 2 stands as the one bad mark on their record there but yeah i mean so x-men so you you have this young cast for the most part relatively Let's unknown not forget the main guy in x-men you have patrick stewart obviously as charles xavier Ian McKellen as Magneto. Those were the two veteran actors brought on board. And then you had a young, I would say a young veteran actor, actress, actor in herself, mm-hmm. in Anna Paquin, who had already won an Oscar by this time, uh, but jumped into the role of Rogue. Um, yeah. It's easy to forget that she is already an Academy Award winner. Yes, actress, she was an know? Academy Award winner at like 12, so or, or whatever, however young she was. I'm not to do what I do best, which is cut you off, but I'm going to right now. You mentioned that Wolverine was not your favorite. I believe we are in agreement that our favorite character is Gambit. Is that correct? This is correct. And especially growing <laughs> up in the 90s, the TV show had a lot to do with that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which is funny because I think the TV show is what made Wolverine a lot of other people's favorite character. But I always tend to go against the grain on a lot of this kind of stuff and lean in, into the other direction. And in this case... Uh, yes, Gambit, like you as well, was my favorite character. Um, we still have yet to see a proper, we'll get into that definitely in today's discussion. Still never seen a proper display of him on screen, which has been somewhat disappointing as an X-Men fan. But to get back to X-Men 1, uh, again, came out 2000. It was successful, made good money. Uh, people liked it overall. It handled the story pretty good. A lot of diehard X-Men fans, I think, were upset that the original X-Men members were kind of a mess a little bit because it was mm-hmm. obviously it should have been Beast, Angel, Gene, and Scott with Professor Xavier. And we had Gene and Scott. Oh, and Bobby too. Bobby, Iceman. Yes. Um, we do get Iceman in, in more of a smaller role in the, in, the, in the first one played by Sean Ashmore. They added Rogue and Wolverine because they were popular from the 90s cartoon. And that was mm-hmm. kind of what made, they wanted to make sure those characters were in the movie. And I think that it helped the movie for sure because Hugh Jackman again comes off really well in the, in, in this movie. Uh, his first big role in the states, um, fantastic, very entertaining. Sabretooth Tyler Maine is kind of he was okay. He served the part well. He looked the part. Yes, um, he looked like the Sabretooth from the cartoon. Yes, he looked the part and did well enough. And he wasn't in it as much, so it didn't it didn't really distract that he wasn't that great of an actor. 
And then you had, um, drawing a blank on the name, but the guy that played Toad, who was also Darth Maul, uh, he did a good job. Ray Park. Ray Park, yes. Ray Park did a good job as Toad. I thought he was, he did well. You know, some of the dialogue's a bit cheesy and stuff in the first one, but it was really well done. It was really, mm-hmm. it's kind of as 90s comic book nerds, it's what the movie we were kind of envisioning when we were wanting this thing to be made for many, many years. Um, and I was excited when it came out. I was really happy with it. I was just happy to see it on the big screen, and I was entertained. You know, we could have dissected it back then. You know, it's just, it was good. There's, you know, nothing glaring. Well, I, for me, there was nothing glaring that ruined it for me. Yes, same here. I was just excited to have them on screen. I wasn't comparing them to their comic versions. Um, I just enjoyed having these characters that I fell in love with on the big screen, and I thought that was huge. I um, disliked Cyclops in the movie like I disliked Cyclops. <laughs> right, exactly. Me and Donovan yeah. just watched the entire X-Men animated series recently on Disney+, Plus, and that was the same, I still had the same thought ever. Like, man, Cyclops is such a dick. Like, And that's yeah. how he comes off in the movie, that the movie franchise. That's how he is in, in the comics. And that's just his character, at least in my opinion. There are probably some Cyclops diehard fans out there who will come to, come to bat for him, but... That's just how I feel. So we had that movie. It did well. It kind of, Like I said, it led to, you know, Spider-Man came out and did much better. And that kind of took mm-hmm. comic book movies in a whole other direction. But while Spider-Man was debuting, a year mm-hmm. later, we had uh, X2. And X-Men 2, up until recently, was my favorite movie of the franchise. Mainly because of the addition. So it was 2003, X2, X-Men United was what it was originally called. But I think people mm-hmm. have forgotten that. And it's just X2 these days. Nightcrawler was added. And Nightcrawler... The Nightcrawler, yes. Huh? Yes, the amazing Nightcrawler. Yes. Nightcrawler was uh, another one of no my French. favorite... I should have gone German. My bad. Yeah. Nightcrawler was another one of my favorite... Uh, favorite Germans. Nightcrawler was another one of my favorite characters. Uh, from the animated series and from the action figures and the comics. Um, so he him, was great in the arcade game too. Yes, he was. He was fantastic in the arcade game. Um, we also forgot to mention in the, about in the first movie, um, Rebecca Romaine uh, played Mystique as well, which we'll yeah. definitely get into her character when it comes in the in the, the more recent franchise. Um, which she did. I thought she did a really good job. Her acting is you kind of have to cast Rebecca Romaine as a certain character for her to play, and I think Mystique mm-hmm. was perfect for her. Um, they really did well on the casting of this one. Brian Singer again returned to the direct X2. Um, it, this one is more about Wolverine, even though the yep. first one... The, it was funny, the first one that's like, they tried to center around everybody. I still feel like Hugh Jackman kind of stole the movie. And then the second one, they're like, well, we got to do a Wolverine-centered movie. And it's like, well, you kind of just did that. Um, <laughs> so they they uh, they go, and Wolverine wants to find out who he was. And anyone that's yep. an X-Men fan will know what that means and where, where they go. Um, so he goes to find the Weapon X program or whatever, and Nightcrawler, um, has been, is being used by bad people, kind of like they kind of brainwashing some of the mutants, and that kind of starts this whole, like, we got to work together with Magneto type of thing, um, mm-hmm. which seems to be the case a lot in these original movies, uh, with the exception of the first one. So yeah, so they had to work with Magneto, and it just... What it did was it took a great idea, which is what the first movie was, and it expanded on it. And I thought it, they did a wonderful job. Holly Berry got even better in this one. I think in the first one she was they 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 wanted her to use the accent in the first one, but she kind of costnered it, so they you could obviously tell that they told her to get rid of it like halfway through shooting because it just disappears. So yeah. which is and then the second movie she just doesn't really have an accent, which is I'm more than fine with. She does such a good job in the role, you don't really miss it, in my opinion. Yeah, it, which is very true. And the first one is when you can see, like, there are a few lines where she tries to throw it in, and then it kind of takes you out of it a little bit. So when yeah. she didn't do that, it really helped. Uh, Famke, also really good at Jean Grey. This is kind of her, her movie as well. Yes. Uh, because of what happens at the end with the, the phoenix flying under the mm-hmm. water, which was supposed to set up this phenomenal third movie. Um, we'll get into yeah, why that man. never happened. Uh, Brian Cox is the main villain. Uh, William Stryker, he was fantastic. Uh, Aaron Stanford is introduced as Pyro in this one. Sean Ashmore's Iceman has a much bigger role. Kelly Who plays Eureka. 
uh, who's supposed to, it's supposed to have those Japanese Wolverine story ties, but they kind of, they really don't get into that in this that much. She's just kind of there because she's another Weapon X power person. And that's what yeah. they have her. They like, kind of really messed up that character, but she did well enough for the part, I think. It was good enough. But this movie, it just, the fact that they expanded on it and they went further, brought in Nightcrawler, really made me love this movie. Uh, Alan Cumming, we should talk about him, who played Nightcrawler, was fantastic. Yes. Um, I think that's what really sells that character in this movie. So we had two great movies, one really yeah. good movie, one really great movie in my opinion. Yeah, um, absolutely. Everyone's waiting for X-Men 3. We're all waiting. Some stuff Talk happen- about a curveball. Yep. St- stuff happens behind scenes. Brian Singer's directing it. All of a sudden, Brian Singer's not directing it anymore. They bring in Brett Ratner, who, in my opinion, has pretty much made one good movie, and that was Red Dragon. And um, he... Comes in and he fumbles it pretty hard. I don't know how much of it was him and how much of it was the screenplay. I'm not quite sure. It it becomes one of those movies that I don't necessarily look at it as terrible, but it's forgettable. Like, certain parts Any, of it, I struggle to remember what is even happening. Anytime a studio starts interfering with the production, you know you're going to have issues. Yes, uh, exactly. I look to another comic book movie, Justice League. Granted, it wasn't a studio meddling as much as a tragedy occurred and a direct change of direction had to happen, but anytime something like that happens, you know it's probably going to be a negative for the film. Yes, yes. And in this case, so they have... It's, they, they try, they're trying to do this whole mutants don't want to be mutants anymore storyline with Rogue because she can't touch anybody, so she hates that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, they're doing the Dark Phoenix storyline. Yeah. At the same time, they're doing the Magneto Brotherhood storyline, where he's trying to put yeah. this huge Brotherhood of Mutants together. He kind of has it in first the first two, but it's never really expanded beyond three villains, basically. So they're right. trying to do this whole thing. At the end of X2, he does get Pyro to, to leave with him, and that's a big part of that movie, kind of like a plot twist. But it just it just doesn't work. It It's one of those movies that... For all that they tried, it just it loses its way probably about halfway through. You really you end up not really caring at a certain point what's going on. We try to be positive on here. So one one positive thing I'll say, another one of my favorite characters from the from the nineties is Beast. And yes. Kelsey Grammer as Beast is perfect. Like Absolutely. And the voice matches, he the physique matches, which I don't know how much he worked out for that role because Kelsey Grammer's never been a guy to like be in shape. Obviously, they put a lot of prosthetics on him, but it just, I don't know. They just kind of, I think the different directors, it definitely did not help. It did not look like Brian Singer's X-Men. It looked like a flashier Brett Ratner type movie, like a Rush Hour type thing. And it just didn't, it didn't work for me. Is there anything positive else that you would say about it, Wayne? I mean, I liked what they tried to do with the storyline, with what happens to Professor X and, you know, the demise of some other X-Men. Yes. I don't know how we're going to go into it, but I'm just going to be vague because mm-hmm. it was bold. There were bold choices. They just, the execution and the follow through just didn't work for me. Yes. It didn't. And I mean, you know, like the deleted scene at the end was very interesting. Yes. But it almost felt like a cop out. Yes, it did, and it and it led to really nothing because they. This is the one movie, as we'll discuss as we get further, that they tried to delete from the franchise. Essentially, right. um, the other thing that really made me angry about this is another character that I think all X Men fans love is Psylocke. She's gorgeous. She's a great character. She's strong. She's a badass. Um, they kind of slid her in, <laughs> like one. There's like three mutants that are like. Uh, uh, kind of lesser mutants and they have like a couple scenes here and there towards the end and one of them is Psylocke but not like not at all Psylocke <laughs> they just and they gave her like a different power it was really silly and it just didn't right. it didn't really make sense another um, one that they did that with was uh Colossus yes in the second yes. one he's there very minor role very brief he's a bigger role in the third one it's just yeah. uh, it's unfortunate that it's a disappointing movie because Thankfully, the character is redeemed Yes, in later films, which we will talk about. Yes, exactly, which we will get to. Um, So jumping right along, we're going to come to 2009. May 1st, 2009. 
X Men Origins Wolverine is released. Oh boy. <laughs> And this is what I mean by tentpole franchise. They were the first ones to branch off. They created another series for another character within their franchise. Albeit not a very good starting for his own franchise. It just... I, this movie is has a... Let's start with the positive. And there's really only one positive. It has a great opening sequence where... Sabretooth and Wolverine go through history through like all the wars. And it's fantastic. Yeah. It's like... That is a great opening, but it's the opening credits. And then yeah. after that, it's just kind of a disaster. Uh, he's living in Canada. He's in love with, uh, I think it's supposed to be Silver Fox, I think. Let me bring this up real quick. Uh, but she, they, we never met her before. So he's in love right. with her, she dies, and then he's upset. And it's like, well, we don't know who this person is. Why should we care that she's dead? Aside from See, the, it's even confusing, though. But is she actually dead, or is she just... She's not okay, and that's the twist in the movie. She's not dead. She comes back later, and that was she was forced to work with them. Albeit, I haven't seen this in quite a few years, and that, this is like, all right, now is he hallucinating or is she actually in on this whole deal? To she had, she's in on it, but it's nope. not because she's bad. It's because they forced her to do it because they gotcha, ki- they gotcha. kidnap her sister, Kayla Silverfox. Yes, Lynn Collins plays Kayla Silverfox. So, and that's the other thing, too, with this movie. So, I'm going to go through the characters with the movie. And it sounds like it should be a great just X-Men movie. You got Liam Schreiber as Victor Creed, a.k.a. Sabretooth, who is fantastic. And yes, honestly, should have been Sabretooth more than once. And we only get him in this film. He was great. Uh, Danny Houston as a young William Stryker. He's fine. He, you know, this evil guy role. He's good at those. Dominic Monaghan plays uh, Blink and... He, or Beak. Sorry, Beak. And he's, like, in it for five minutes. He's okay, fine, whatever. Mm-hmm. This is the another big script. Ryan Reynolds as Wade Wilson slash Deadpool. We never really get Wade Wilson slash Deadpool in this movie. Yes, he's Wade Wilson in the beginning, but then when he becomes officially becomes Deadpool, they close his mouth. He has no mouth. He's the Merc with the mouth. Why would you get rid of his mouth? That's the one thing that you need him to have. So just a disaster. Obviously, if you've seen the Deadpool movies, Ryan Reynolds touches on this. And then Taylor Kitsch is finally, we were waiting, Gambit on the big screen. He is by name only that is not Gambit, I refuse to acknowledge. What the hell happened? I li- I actually like Taylor Kitsch, but what the hell happened? I-, I don't know what they were thinking. It was just kind of like a last minute written in part. He comes in halfway through the movie and then he's there at the end and Wolverine loses his memory. And he's like, who are you? Which explains why we don't know who Gambit is in the future. Really? But yeah, just a, just a disaster. He kind of has an accent, not really. It's um, another one of those that's like there and not. Yeah. It's like a, uh, 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 Will I Am, one of his few acting roles, is John Wraith. is another character. He's a te- like a Nightcrawler teleports. I wasn't really familiar with him. He was fine, whatever. Mm-hmm. Kind of served his purpose. Here's another one. Ken, Kevin Durant, who's an actor I like a lot, who I just watched in Real Steel again, as the blob. The Blob should have been a great character. He's just, he's in it. He's very big in the beginning, but he's not the Blob yet. Next time you see him, he's the Blob. He really doesn't do it. They fight and that's it. And it's like, it's just, again, another character that really didn't need to be there. Or if that was going to be there, should have been a lot better. Has played some epic villains in his time. Very much appreciated. Yes, yes. As somebody that a lot of people will recognize by face. Yes, but he, yeah, he does play a lot of those kind of like, Good, Guys you good. love to hate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's which is why you know every now and then when he plays a hero, I'm excited because I always like to see the bad guy, the guys I like as villains. I like to see him play heroes every once in a while. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's just yeah, it's just a mess. It's a mess all over the place. They they don't know what they were doing. Gavin Hood, who was a good director, I just I don't think not everybody is meant for these type of movies, and I think he's one of those directors who realized quickly that this was not the type of movie for him. It just doesn't work. It falls apart soon after the opening credits, and then is just a rolling disaster from that point on. The, the special effects aren't even good. Like, the claws are different sizes sometimes. Like, it's just really weird. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Is This what did have a good backstory point where we see Wolverine get the adamantium we, in his skeleton. Yes, we do get to see the kind of the entirety of the Weapon X program. We got to see it a little bit in X2. Right. They expand on it in this, uh, which those parts were shot well. I mean, they, they did that part correctly for the most part. The visuals uh, were cool. Yes, I don't know yeah. How it well just, executed it all. Yes, exactly. It was, 
Again, it was it, rather rushed. Yes, yes, it was. It was. I, I almost forgot that they even touched on that. So two years later, we get our next movie. It's kind of like a reboot, but it's part of the same franchise. It's X Men First Class, directed by Matthew Vaughn, uh, who did Kick Ass and many other great films. So he steps in to direct. He does a good job. And but everybody was expecting, I think, the original X Men, but they had to keep it tied into the old franchise. So you you get a younger Professor X, you get a younger Magneto, and a younger Mystique, but a lot of the characters are new. So you get Banshee thrown in there, another character mm-hmm. named Angel that's not Angel, it's a different yeah. Angel, played by uh, the lovely <laughs> Zoe Kravitz. This one I liked. It was different. It's set in the '60s during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin Bacon is the villain, which I said, I, you, yes. I think it was last week or the week before Ke- any movie with Kevin Bacon instantly is better. Cause he's in it. This is one of those movies. The um, flashback of Eric Lesher in his past being yes. a, uh, the opening scene. Survivor. Yes. The opening scene with Matt, with a young, uh, Magneto where he first discovers his powers in a concentration mm-hmm. camp. Uh, very powerful stuff. Really good intro to this movie. Again, diehards weren't as big of a fan of it. I enjoyed it. I, you know, the X-Men franchise, the continuity of these movies is all over the place. It's never going to match up. Like, here's the realistic thing is the original movie came out in 2000. This movie takes place in the 60s. So we're supposed to believe that Mystique, played by Jennifer Lawrence in one era and played by Rebecca Romaine in another, who are maybe 15 years apart in age, maybe a little more here or there, are supposed to be like 40 years difference in age. Like, that doesn't, the math doesn't really add up when you think about it. Um, Thankfully, she's a shapeshifter, so there he goes. Story. Right, exactly. <laughs> Wipe it away. But I, one of the main characters in this one is also Beast, played by Nicholas Holt, so I did like that addition. Yep. I thought that he does a really good job. They, uh, yeah, I mean, they establish this, this cast very well. They do, you know, they have the whole, and it's become a thing in, in superhero movies, get the team together uh, montages. They do the same thing with mm-hmm. this one. Fastbender and McAvoy are great together. Their characters are really what drives this part of the series, like the, this franchise. Yeah, so I really enjoyed it. I, I don't know how you felt about it, Wayne, when it came out. Absolutely. It was really entertaining to see Professor X as a young as a boy going through this and going through the whole deal about being a mutant and whatnot yeah. and using his powers to pick up chicks. You know, hey, what most people would do. You know, hey, how you doing? Make some money, make some women. <laughs> Well, and what was nice about this one, too, because we were supposed to get, after the Wolverine movie, they were talking about doing a Magneto movie. Because the Wolverine movie was critically hated, uh, everybody, they scratched that, and they basically turned this into the Magneto backstory, which I think it worked well. Um, I'm glad they did it this way. I don't know if I would have wanted to sit through an entire Magneto movie where you don't really have any of the other characters. Um, The relationship between him and Mystique in this one is really good. You also get a uh, Havoc, uh, who is uh, Cyclops' older brother, um, which yep. we all know that. If you're a comic book fan, you know that. Um, he's a good introduction to the, into the cast. Um, yep. Yeah, I don't know. This movie I thought was good. I liked it. Yeah. I was worried because Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen has such a good on-screen, back-and-forth relationship, love-hate thing, as Magneto and Professor X. And I think uh, McAvoy and uh, Fassbender... Uh, do a really good job uh, having that love hate relationship again, and it's that's good. That was one of the things I was really worried about, and uh, I didn't need to be. So. Yeah, no, they did, they did, they were really good together, and I kind of hope we get to see more movies with them later. Uh, not not as these characters, obviously, but just more movies where they get to be in it together. Moving right along, they don't take a lot of breaks in the X Men universe. Two thousand thirteen. The Wolverine, the second uh, go for the Wolverine franchise, directed by James Mangold. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the Japanese story that everybody wanted to, to hear, where Wolverine goes to Japan and kind of finds himself, um, falls in love, all that kind of stuff. I really liked it. I think it's underrated. I feel like, obviously, the bar that the first movie set wasn't very high. So right. didn't have to do a lot to get me on board. Um, I'm a huge fan of James Mangold. He's a great director. So I was a big fan of this movie. Um, I just watched it again recently with Donovan. He seemed to enjoy it. The train, the bullet train sequence is fantastic. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably one of the best action set pieces the X-Men movies had. Uh, Hugh Jackman is great as usual. The the uh, new cast is really good as well. Um, 
Famke Jansen is in it too for a little bit as Jean Grey and some like uh, dream sequences, flashback type stuff. It does bring in some new characters. One of the negatives of it is uh, Silver Samurai, which is not really Silver Samurai. Some no. guy in a robotic costume who's trying to steal Wolverine's. Uh, Reminded me of the Shredder from. Yeah, the, exactly. The, the like it just. Uh, Michael Bay. Yeah, it's still like I said, yeah. still a good movie. I just that part did bother me. I know it bothered a lot of people. Uh, it was interesting to see the the flashback of the, the intro to where Wolverine is a prisoner of war. Yes, and, yes, and that was really cool. Blast, and that was cool. Enjoyed that very much. I like that part a lot. Um, the best new character to the franchise in this movie was played by Rila Fukushima, who played Yukio, who was the mutant who could see the future of everybody and how they were going to die. She was a really good addition. I was kind of disappointed that she hasn't come back since they introduced her. But yeah, she did a really good job. And like I said, this movie, if you ever get a chance to watch it, try to watch the unrated director's cut on Blu-ray because it adds in a lot of more of the, the... the gory stuff that you want from a Wolverine movie, which we'll get to soon, thankfully, because they, they made one. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so this movie, I don't know. To me, I thought it was good. It still holds up. How do you feel about it, Wayne? It was different. It just different. They tried to they tried to do different stuff with it. They expanded on the first one. I have nothing negative to say, really. I mean, we commented on the, Sil- the Silver Samurai, but, you know, well done. You know, you took you took something that was not good, and you made something entertaining. And, yes. You know, good job. And I think that to me, that's all they needed to do was they took something that was pretty awful and just made it entertaining and good to a certain point. They didn't have to make it great; they just had to make it watchable, <laughs> and that's what they did. All right. So, now we are getting into one of my favorite X Men movies. One of I think everybody's favorite yes. X Men movies. One year later. Less than a year later. So Wolverine came out in July of 2013. Just in May of 2014, you get one of the best movies of the franchises in a lot of people's opinion, and both of us are in agreement. X-Men Days of Future Past. It, it's a time-traveling love story, I'm a, telling you. Yes, it's a time, you're right. It is a time-traveling time love story. I didn't even think of that. That's amazing. Um, you love those. So yeah, Brian Singer returns. Behind the to the director's chair of the sequel to X Men First Class, so you get Fastbender, you get Jennifer Lawrence back, you get um, uh, McAvoy back, uh, Havoc returns, I think minimally, but he's still in it. Uh, but the best part about it is you get Wolverine added into yes. the mix, and that's you know they changed the story from the comics. They even changed the story from the the cartoon a little bit. Um, but this was a storyline everybody wanted because. Not only was it great in the comic, but it was great. It was one of the biggest parts of the uh, cartoon as well, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, you know, all that stuff, the the Bishop storyline in the cartoon, that's basically what takes this place from the comics. And yes. so they bring in, so that's what's great in the beginning. You get, you get Bishop, mm-hmm. you get Link, you get uh, Sunspot, um... You get uh, uh, Warpath, a bunch of different characters yep. that were on the cartoons or in the comics that we never got to see. Even though we only see them briefly, it was fun to see them. The return of uh, Shadowcat, played by Ellen Page. Uh, Rogue, yep. Rogue Anna Pagwin comes back. Um, just a bunch of characters return, which is great. Bobby, Sean Ashmore as Iceman is there for yes. a bit. Yes, yep, yep, he is there as well. Um and I think most Rogue is in it for a minute, but most of her scenes are in the deleted scenes. There's now the 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 Rogue cut, yes. um, but I know she's in it like the end of the movie when they when they come right back around. So this movie was basically set up to erase X Men: The Last Stand. That was the main reason behind it. Wolverine travels back in time because the future is falling apart, and they need the X Men to save the day. They are basically defeated because of the Sentinels. Yes, the Sentinels have destroyed them. They go back in time to stop the person from killing uh, Bolivar Trask. The person mm-hmm. that was going to kill Bolivar Trask, we find out, is Mystique, played by Jennifer Lawrence, who was great. We didn't really mention her as part of First Class. She was one of the big, you know, surprises of First Class. That was kind of like she, rather than that and Hunger Games were like right around the same time. So that was yeah. when she was blown up. So she returns for this sequel. Uh, she's great in this role. She, she, they give her a lot to do in these first two movies that they don't give a lot to the other characters. And she does yes. a really good job. To me, though, as much as Wolverine, this is a Wolverine movie, to me, this was McAvoy's movie. X-Men yep. First Class was 
Magneto's backstory, Professor X gets his backstory told basically in the X-Men Days of Future Past. We find out more, a lot about him. Get to see McAvoy give some of the, you know, some of the better scenes I think that he's acted in his career and it's in an X-Men movie. And I think that's when I watched this movie, that was one of my main things coming out was how great he was in it. My initial response is, why the heck is he walking around? They explained it. They explained it. it. Yep. We moved on. They explained it. The beast. Uh, the one thing that still gets me, and we'll talk about this more when we get to the the last uh, our review of the week teaser right there, is how Beast changes back and forth. I I know they dev- they made it like a drug, so like I, I didn't like that. Like that was the one thing about this part of the franchise I didn't care for. I thought he was great as Beast. I just wanted him to be blue all the time. I get it's easier for the actor not to be blue all the time, but I think... It, they save some money on special effects. Exactly. That's what I wanted. <laughs> I wanted it to be that way. Absolutely. And it, let's be honest, it should have been. Yes. Um, but everything else is great. You you have uh, Peter Dinklage as Bolivar Trask. He is fantastic. Yes. Um, it's kind of like a villain who doesn't know he's a villain, which I think is really good in how they play that. Um, Shut up, Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> but yeah, everyone's great in this. Fastbender, just the whole movie comes together really well. It's done fantastically. It kind of ends on a high note. I, I thought... love Evan Peters as Quicksilver. Yes. Little backstory. Quicksilver is the son of Magneto. Uh, Quicksilver is recruited because he's very fast. Yes. And he is needed to help break uh, his father, who he is unknowing father, out of prison. And they threw this little 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 bit of dialogue in there where when Magneto and Quicksilver meet, they do give a little exchange like, you look familiar to me. Yep, exactly. They have that like, I know you, but I don't know you look. Mm-hmm. Um, that Yeah, and that's a good place, to br- a good thing to bring up because Evan Peters is Quicksilver. Not only he was great in this movie, but that sequence that they have where they're yes. breaking him out of, that is probably one of the best sequences in any X-Men movie. It was fantastic. They got to do it before Avengers Age of Ultron. I'm sure the Marvel uh, MCU people were upset about that. Uh, but Because you can't top it. There's nothing you could do that's better than what they did in that scene. Just how they filmed it, yep. how it looked. It was fantastic. It's really interesting because in a lot of ways, they don't let a character be used in separate uh, storylines. Like, look at... Um... When the bat when Batman Begins movies were really popular, there was no other Batman. No, DC wouldn't movie. allow it. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why uh, the Batman character Bruce Wayne never appeared on Smallville. Yeah, they're starting and, uh, to they lighten up. Made... Sorry, I, I stepped on you there. You're good. Uh, they're starting to lighten that up a little bit, as you've seen. Now we have a Superman on on uh, uh, the Arrowverse, and they've had Batman this yes, he's last. Yes, just not year. very good. Yeah, they've had an older Batman this last year, so they have touched on that with the Marvel movies. And the X Men movies, you, there was one of those characters that was in the. It was the contract that was they could you, both people could use them, and it just yep. so happened that they wanted to bring Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver into the MCU, and then they wanted to bring Quicksilver into uh, X Men, and they both did it successfully. I think, uh, mm-hmm. obviously, as we know as an MCU fan, Scarlet Witch became a much bigger character over there than Quicksilver. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think they did a good job with this character in here. There, are, I wish he would have had more to do in this movie. Um, yep. He is in the other movie, so we will talk about him as well. I just, yeah, I mean, it was just overall, like when I saw this movie, I was just in love with it. It was fantastic. It, mm-hmm. I loved everything about it. Anything and then else? at the end, the tie-in with how a memory is lost again with the present-day Wolverine being sucked back to his present time. Yes, yes. He... I don't know. Can we talk? Should we? Yeah, leave you it can. There? It's it's old enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, you know the drowning, but not really yeah. drowning. Mm-hmm. And William Stryker's back. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who is who is Mystique though in that last scene? Yes. The eyes do go yellow. You always got to watch for that with right. her. Um. So the next one, two years later, and this is a movie I've been waiting for. I feels like my whole life. We yes. finally get Deadpool. Uh, directed by Tim Miller, starring Ryan Reynolds, written by Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, the guys behind uh, Zombieland. Just I mean, what uh, what can I say about this movie? It's amazing. I love every second of this movie, uh, from start to finish. Ryan Reynolds is awesome. The mm. story structure is great. Colossus is fantastic. Um, yes, a little bit over the top, 
but yes. the way it, Colossus should have been portrayed. Yes, exactly. It was just it, they handled everything pretty much how it should be. They didn't worry about oh well the costumes don't look cool enough or the characters not cool enough. We should change it. They did it how how the comics said it should be for the most part. Now it was all tongue in cheek because it was all very funny, obviously. Um, but I think they handled it very well. You really have a great cast with uh, T.J. Miller, Gina Carano, Ed Screen, Marina Baccarin. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Brianna Hildebrand as Negasonic Teenage Warhead is fantastic. Uh, she is a new recruit. She is awesome mm-hmm. in this movie. Uh, she's been awesome in some other things I've seen, but she's really good here. Yeah, I mean, Karan Sony. Huh? Karan Sony. Yeah. I know it's a character portrayal, and you know, but I just he had a lot of good comic relief for me. I just really enjoyed his little snippets there, yeah. just the back and forth between uh, T.J. Miller's Weasel character and Rod Reynolds' Wade slash Deadpool. Just yeah. that back and forth there is just you thinking about what had to have gone into shooting that scene and keeping a straight face and just and just knowing the comedic abilities of both of those actors. Yes, God, I had to have taken you know. Many, many scenes, hours to probably get just perfect because it's just hilarious. It's the deadpan delivery. Yes. Good stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great use of DMX. So we could do we could do an entire podcast on Deadpool and everything we love about Deadpool. We're, we're mm-hmm. running long here, so we're going to just move right along. Uh, three months later, X-Men Apocalypse came out. Eh. Yes, it did. Eh. <laughs> After the high of Deadpool... And the, in my opinion, the high of getting someone like Oscar Isaac to portray Apocalypse was very exciting. Eh, it wasn't terrible, but it's not good. <laughs> like, yeah. it, Oscar you know, Isaac's coming off the uh, the success, if you will, of Force um, Awakens. The Force Awakens. Yes, kind of. Uh, that in and of itself, when we get to Star Wars, <laughs> is something we're going to have to, to begrudgingly address. Yes, of course. With, toxicity and whatnot and, so and, x-men apocalypse takes place in the 80s so every this x-men series we jump a decade a decade so you have uh first classes of the 60s days of future passes the 70s this one x-men apocalypse is the 80s you get james mcavoy back as professor x fastbender as magneto lawrence as mystique oscar isaac plays apocalypse nicholas holt beast rose byrne returns which she was not in days of future past but she was in x-men first class yes. um Ty Sheridan joins the cast as Cyclops. Sophie Turner is a young Jean Grey. Olivia Munn. Finally, we get a Psylocke. We get a Psylocke that looks like Psylocke. Mm -hmm. She acts like Psylocke. But guess what we're not going to get? A lot of Psylocke in the movie. Kind of disappointed. What did you think of uh, Josh Hellman as a young Colonel William Stryker? He was good. Because he was in Future Past, too, right? He was was at the end, yes. Yeah. He was the one that was portrayed by, well, not totally portrayed as Mystique, but at the end, yes. I thought he was good. He looked like Stifler, so that kind of took me out of it a little bit. <laughs> you, you know, you mentioned that, and now I can't unsee that. He is good, though. He, he's a good actor. Um, I've seen him in a few other things. I think I want to say he's like Australian or something. Plays the evil guy, the evil jerky dude really well. Yes, yes. Cody Smith McPhee is Nightcrawler. I like again. I really like Nightcrawler, so I was okay with his portrayal. He did a good job. Alexander Hardy is Angel again. Angel, just stop trying to do Angel unless you're going to do yeah. it right. For God's sakes, Ben Foster was great, but they totally screwed it up in X Men Three. Yeah. We didn't mention him. I was because... going to say Ben Foster. That yeah, was probably the most uh, accurate. I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it was close. He played it very well. It just wasn't. It's just he was barely in the movie, hence why we for, totally forgot to mention him. Uh, mm-hmm. Ben Hardy plays Angel in this one. He does a fine job. He's not terrible or anything. Lana Condor is Jubilee, who many people have come to know from uh, the Netflix movies that she has. The two uh, P.S. The Boys, uh, The Boys I Love You, or whatever that series is. Good romance rom com series. We'll get into that probably when we do rom coms, which we'll do at some point, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, Lucas Tillis Havoc returns for a small part. I'm not spoiling anything. He dies in the beginning. They kill him off. It's kind of a jumping off point. Uh, to get the other younger mutants have to go and rescue the older mutants who were kidnapped. And then it, like, that happens and all that stuff. And then to me, the movie just becomes a putting a team together movie for both sides. It's 
Professor X going around and get, it's like the young mutants of Professor X trying to gather all the mutants for their team. And then Apocalypse going around. Every other scene is like a, we need your help. I need you. You're going to be my mutant. He, he, Apocalypse <laughs> gets Storm. He gets Angel. He gets Psylocke. He gets Magneto. So those are the four horsemen of the Apocalypse. In reality, Angel's the only one that actually is a four horsemen of the Apocalypse in the comics. But some people were upset about that, as you can imagine. I thought Alexandra Ship. I thought she did a good job. Her accent was really good. She stuck with it, and it, it it's probably one of the better things about this movie. She did a really good job playing Storm. And she played Storm with the Mohawk, which I think has always been kind of the badass look for Storm. Absolutely. Um, other than that, this movie was a disappointment. I mean... Apocalypse is this big overall threat, and you never really, you never feel it. You never feel like they're going to lose. Uh, Quicksilver has another cool scene at the end. Other than that, it's just kind of it. It was just a meh. It, to me, I know a lot of people hated it. To me, I didn't hate it. It was just kind of forgettable, kind of similar to X Men Last there's, Stand. There's nothing in there that really set it apart or made it stand out. Yeah. All right, but move, taking that that movie that lackluster, not really living up to it. And we get the 2017 swan song, if you will, for the Wolverine character, Logan. R-rated, bloody, finally, dirty, dirty, a Western, basically. I mean, James Mangold returns, and he did uh, 310 to Yuma, which to me is an underrated Western. Uh, Absolutely. And this, he basically shot this as a Western. It's a Western-type story. It's one guy kind of like his last ride. Like, this is going to be it. It's Logan, Professor X, um, and that's basically... And then there's the young uh, X-23, who is... Played uh, by Daphne Keene. Daphne Keene, who is fantastic in this movie. Um, very, very interesting in the way that plays out. Yes. Uh, and she's basically Wolverine's clone, as if anyone knows the stories of X-23. And they're basically the job is to protect her. Professor X tells Wolverine that we got to protect her. And then Logan just wants life to be over at this point he's lost everybody he's ever cared about except for professor x um there's another good uh character portrayal in this but he's lost his healing powers he's dying from adamantium poisoning i believe yes yes which was a great kind of like twist into it like the things that made him stronger is the thing that's going to end up killing him um steven merchant as caliban is great uh Mm -hmm. he's like the only other mutant in the movie, aside from the other ones we mentioned. What's interesting is he's actually also in X-Men Apocalypse, but not Stephen Merchant. Someone else plays him. He's the one that's working with Psylocke. Psylocke's like his bodyguard. That's also Caliban. So I don't know. Like, again, the continuity in these movies is all over the place. They really, none of them ever make sense if you try to put them next to each other. One thing doesn't make sense to the next thing. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's... It's so dark, it's dreary, it's bloody. It gives us everything that we wanted out of a Wolverine movie. Um, Again, in the Wolverine movies, just they kept going up. Started out really bad, got better with the Wolverine, and Logan just was like the cherry on top. Nominated for Best Mm -hmm. uh, Adapted Screenplay at the Oscars. Like, that's when was that ever going to happen? That was awesome. I was was excited about that. Um, Boyd Holbrook is the villain, is the one chasing Wolverine down. Uh, He does a really good job. He's done some really good work uh, since this movie. Um, it's just, again, it's like Deadpool. It's hard for, for me to tell people how much I love this movie, but I love yes. this movie. Like it sits at the top of not just X-Men movies, but comic book movies, including the MCU movies. Like mm-hmm. it's just so well done. If you take away the mutant stuff out of it, it's just a great Western. Like it's this great yeah. modern, uh, modern day Western, obviously because it takes place in the future, but it's just so good. And what my wife, I think, the most exciting thing for her was Wolverine versus Wolverine when they finally have the clone of of the older yeah. Wolverine at the end. That farmhouse scene right there, where oh my god, the oh. demise of Charles Xavier, and finding out that he is actually the reason that all of the mutants are gone. Yep, because of his health issues, which caused you know basically the death of of everybody. Yep, everybody. Yeah, like almost like humans. Like everybody's like the whole world is like ravished basically, and there's there's hardly any mutants left. There aren't as many humans left as there used to be. Uh, it's just a wasteland, and it's just it's so good. The action sequences are fantastic. The gore and the violence is great. If you like that kind of stuff, obviously, if you're not into that, don't watch it. Um, yeah, but like you were saying though, like I, I commented earlier about the farmhouse and just what the hell is going on? Yep. And then the reveal that that is actually a clone 
or a copy or yeah, clone and copy or same thing. Sorry, yeah. duh. <laughs> and the the Wolverine Bowl basically. It's like holy cow. Yeah, it was. It's crazy. And anyone that hasn't seen it, I really recommend watching it. It's obviously it's been uh, lampooned uh, in our next movie, Deadpool Two, uh, directed by David Leach, uh, starring Ryan Reynolds, of course, as he returns as Wade Wilson slash Deadpool. Um, I love this movie. Not probably not as much as the first one, but almost as much as the first one. I'm a huge X Force fan as well, so the fact that they brought Cable in uh, was yeah. big for me. Uh, Josh Brolin, I thought was fantastic. I honestly didn't think of him when I was trying to figure out who would be good to play this role. When they cast him, I was like, well, shit, that's perfect. Like, yeah. just never crossed my mind that he would even do it. And when they cast him, it was great, even though he is also a Thanos. Marina Baccarin returns. Uh, Julian Dennison plays Fire Fist, who's a new young mutant that we meet that's not so happy with how he's been treated, which once you find out how, you completely understand Indeed. Uh, Zazie Beats as Domino is fantastic. Uh, Leslie Ugams. Uh, Leslie Ugams. 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 Excuse me. Just fantastic. The comedy between her and Ryan Reynolds is just... <laughs> it's yes. morbid and it's gross and it's hilarious. <laughs> it is great. Um we get the return of Negasonic Teenage Warhead and her girlfriend. I'm trying to find her, her character's name for a second. I think it's Yuki, I believe. Yukio? Was it Yuki? Yeah, another Yukio, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Like her like her and Ryan Reynolds back and forth is great. Mm-hmm. Like just the whole uh, thing they have. So, okay, well, I love the movie. It's a great movie. It's another time travel movie uh, in the franchise. Yeah. Kind of more, not a love story though. It's more of because he's upset because his family's dead. Um, the best part, of, not the best part, but one of the, everyone's, I think, favorite parts of this movie was the X-Force scene with the Team X-Force. You get Terry Crews as Bedlam, Louis Tan mm-hmm. as Shatterstar, Bill Skarsgård, who played Pennywise as Zeitgeist, Rob Delaney as Peter, the man with no powers, and the great Brad Pitt as Vanisher, a very yep. quick cameo, blinking, you miss it cameo. Um, they get Let's this team together, forget. they go up to the airplane. <laughs> And then everything goes crazy and everybody dies except for him and Domino. And it's fantastic. It's a great sequence in the film. It's kind of, it's got the, uh, I believe they're playing ACDC, I think. And like, it's just crazy. And then everything just mayhem just ensues and it's just nuts. And outstanding. It's great set piece in that movie. Um, you do get a little bit of cameo from the stars of X-Men Dark Phoenix, which we're going to get into. We are going to review this week. Um, yes coming up also cameos by alan tuddick and matt damon yes as the yes which was great um because also because uh matt damon was also in thor ragnarok um which the year before uh so funny seeing matt damon pop up in these superhero movies but if anyone's wondering who they were when um cable comes to uh comes from the future they're the two guys drinking beers in the truck which is great uh you can tell it's alan tuddick matt damon's a little more disguised Right. Uh, and I think they Let's did that because not everyone's going to recognize Alan Tudyk. Of course, we also have Fred Savage playing Fred Savage as well. Yes. Yes, we do. And they... I love the Wonder Years. i got to throw him a bone. Oh, no, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so then that leads us to our review of the week, which is Da-da-da. 2019's X-Men Dark Phoenix. Directed by Simon Kinberg, who had been uh, working on the screenplays and producing the last couple movies. Um, It came out June 7th of 2019, so many of you may have already seen it. Wayne and I had not seen it, so we decided to start off our franchise section and go go big with X-Men. It obviously took us about 50 minutes to get through that entire franchise. Um, Now we're going to go and do uh, the review of Dark Phoenix. It basically takes place 10 years after... Again, 10 years after uh, Apocalypse, because it takes place in the 90s. Roughly 10 years. It may not be exactly 10 years. <laughs> the main cast returns from Apocalypse. Um, there really aren't too many additions. Jessica Chastain is the villain in this one. She plays an alien. So it starts out, they go to outer space, and they're trying to save this space crew. 
The Endeavor. The Endeavor. And Jean Grey is, there's this big force there, as we'll find out what that force is in a minute. She goes out to save the last astronaut while, Night, while Nightcrawler is jumping along trying to save all the astronauts. She tries to stop everything from, from going haywire. She takes on this force, which we find out later is the Phoenix Force. They then come back to Earth, and she starts acting weird. So yep. they start trying to figure out what's going on. She gets a little crazy. I'm going to spoil this part because if you've seen the trailer, you already know it's going to happen. Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique, she kind of addressed that she's been tired of playing this role for so many years. She only makes it probably about, what, 30 minutes maybe into this movie? And, if that. Yeah, and they they kill her off. That's the kind of the jumping off point for the other X-Men because Beast gets mad and goes try to find Magneto because he knows Magneto will hate her as much as he does. Um, the other X-Men try to save her because she's an X-Men and they know it's not her fault. Obviously, Cyclops is in mm-hmm. love with her. It just... Yeah, so that that's basically it jumps off from there and then it just keeps going and it's not even fifty minutes till we get I think it's fifty minutes before we even get to see Magneto in the movie. It you know it handled the I think it handled the Dark Phoenix saga better than Last Stand. Mm-hmm. But I still didn't think it was that good. It <sighs> It was not quite as a much disappointment for me as Apocalypse was. It was interesting to hear the backstory about what happened to Jean mm-hmm. and what um, Professor X did to try and help her. Yes, and, yes, that part was interesting. Whole... I, I do think so. Um, yeah, it, you know what? And I think a lot of it, too, with this one. So you had Days of Future Past, which expectations were high, but they exceeded expectations. Yes. They announced Apocalypse. Expectations are super high now because Days of Future Past was great. That movie didn't do wasn't that good, so because it didn't live up to the hype, we have heard nothing but bad things about Dark Phoenix. So going into it, yes, I was expecting it to be awful, and mm-hmm. it wasn't awful, but I didn't really like. I don't know that I'll watch it again unless I do like a rewatch of the whole franchise. Maybe right. I didn't. The one thing because I, I tried to look out because I know they kind of rushed to finish it because it was a whole Disney Fox thing. Disney bought yep. Fox, and it was kind of thrown into turmoil. The, I didn't think the storm effects were that great. Like, the lightning looked kind of cheesy. Right. I do, however, I did like the train sequence. Um, another good train sequence in the X-Men movie. When they're all uh, being held on the train and they break free. I, or they get set free. I did yes. like that sequence a lot. I thought that was done really well. Um, the X-Men do trains well. Yes. <laughs> or not so well, because they usually destroy the shit out of them. But. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the scene, it was a really good scene. Um, and that, that's just it. It was like a movie that kind of had a meandering story that didn't really go to the places where I wanted it to go. But the set pieces were really cool. Um, I was disappointed Quicksilver gets hurt early on and he's just gone yes. from the movie. So I assume Evan Peters is probably busy. Like right. that's probably yeah. what happened. So we're kind of... He hurt when uh, Raven... Mystique is... When Mystique is, is taken uh, out, he gets hurt trying to stop uh, Jean, uh, a.k.a. Dark Phoenix at this point, um, who just kind of levels her whole, her dad's home and the area where he lives and stuff when she finds out that he's alive. That's yes. a whole other turning point, too. Um, I thought well, Sophie, yeah. Sophie Turner did a good job um, for the most part. She got a lot of flack where she kind of... You know, coming off of playing her iconic role of Sansa Stark in mm-hmm. uh, Game of Thrones, you know, she I, I think she did pretty well. Um, I think people didn't give don't give her enough credit for what she did in uh, the X Men series. But mm-hmm. Yeah, no as, as short lived as it was, yeah, she did a good job. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it, the, okay, so when we, I was talking earlier about the Beast changing from Beast to Human Beast, yeah. It's worse in this movie. Like you just, like now it's just like it's like he's mystique. Like anytime mm-hmm. he wants to be beast, he's just like, Alright, I gotta beast up now and he just like becomes beast. Didn't like it. Felt it was worse in this movie. Just it, it I, grained on me. I don't know why. It just grained on me so much. I made a connection to um Teen Wolf. Yes. Where he could just go back and forth whenever he wants. And yeah, and it's just so weird. Like the first couple movies he had to like take a drug to get rid of it, and now all yeah. of a sudden he's just figured it out i i don't know it was just really didn't work for me we do get a good nightcrawler berserker moment which i thought was really cool i wasn't expecting that and i thought that was fun 
Uh, that's towards the end a little bit where Nightcrawler gets very upset uh, when something happens. And he, yeah, he basically think of Wolverine when Wolverine goes berserk in X2 or in, in the entirety of Logan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's that kind of a scene where he just kind of loses his cool for, for a minute. And not to completely derail our progress moving forward and our main review, but in X-Men Apocalypse, there is that cameo where Wolverine Weapon X is in Crater Lake and the Jean Grey character, Jean Grey character by uh, played by Sophie Turner does kind of bring some memories back to Wolverine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a really good it was a cool scene uh, from that from that movie. Um, probably well, I one mean, of... it's so uh, it's so that movie is in and of itself is so unremarkable. <laughs> they even a cool scene like that. It's kind of like eh. it's it slips your brain, and that you know, and that one kind of I I think this movie kind of improved a little bit upon some of those memorable moments because, like I said, there I think there are some scenes I will remember going forward. Like I said, the nightcrawler scene at the end, the train scene yes. that's part of the train scene. Um, but overall, again, it's just another misstep. I think. Kinberg, he did okay directing here. It wasn't awful like I was led to believe, but I, I don't know. Again, it just it just left me feeling somewhat disappointed again. And that, it sucks because the X-Men franchise was something I always cling to because they were my love in the 90s was the X-Men. Everybody else was Spider-Man or, or uh, Captain America or some of the other characters. I was X-Men. I'm an X-Men kid. Um so when I see a bad X Men movie, it really does hurt me. I think more than watching a bad any other type of movie. So, uh, but yeah. So overall, I, I would say two point five out of five stars. You know, at the most. Yeah. Um, you want? Right, I, don't think you, I don't think you'll regret watching it, but you'll just kind of forget about it and move on. I think. If there's anything else you want to watch instead, though, probably go with that first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do that instead. Um, all right, so last week we started our new segment, Gone But Not Forgotten, and we're going to go into that this week as well. Uh, we all, I will get to who we're going to talk about, but first I'm going to start off with the um, rest in peace. We didn't. I, this week was one of those weeks where I'm like, oh, we're not going to, no celebrities have like passed away, except for the first guy I'll mention, but then two just passed away last night. Um, yes. So we'll talk about... Uh, John Lewis, rest in peace. He was a, a giant among men, part of the civil rights movement. Passed away, unfortunately. You know, it sucks. Yeah, like a time that, that you know that we could use we could use some hope at, at this time. And um, but also last night we lost uh, Regis Philbin, who we did. doesn't really not much in the movies, but well, obviously it was big in TV. Um, mm-hmm. And he was older. I believe he was sick. And that yes. still doesn't make it suck any less. Uh, we remember him. Rest in peace, Regis. Uh, and then the last guy I'll remember is big for me because he was the father of Nancy in Nightmare on Elm Street. was John Saxon. Yes. Character actor in a lot of horror movies. He was also in Enter the Dragon. A lot of people may know him from that with Bruce Lee. Great actor. Um, just a lot of cool roles. Uh, 80 years old. Rest in peace, John. We will miss you. We're going to get on to the main man of this uh, week's segment, and that is the late, great Robin Williams. Uh, we talked about him last week a little bit while we talked about Chris Farley. We said we'd get to him. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that this past week was Robin Williams' birthday, so I figured it was probably best to, to do it now. He would have been 69, I think, like on, on uh, Tuesday. Yes. Um, you know, Wayne, I wanted to ask you, what's your first memory of Robin Williams? Uh, the first time I saw Robin Williams, it was with my parents on a VHS copy of 1986's Live at the Met. Completely inappropriate for children. Uh, this was probably late 80s. I saw this as like a seven or eight-year-old, only in parts because my parents had enough sense to not let me watch the whole thing. But just the energy and the patent leather shoes, just amazing. I couldn't understand why he was sweating so much, though, as a child. Later on, we figured it out. Well, he had a little helper here. Uh, also, I remember him from Mork and Mindy in uh, syndication and reruns. Mork and Mindy was probably the first time I saw him because I used to watch, me and my buddy uh, Jeb Rendell would always watch like the old Nick at Night TV shows, and that was one of them. Um, so that's probably the first time I saw him. But the first time that I kind of like felt like he was part of my generation, like for me, was, was Hook when he played Peter Pan. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, if you go back and, as, a, as an adult, you go back and look at Hook, and Hook is horribly reviewed. People hated that movie. Uh, but it's directed by Steven Spielberg. I love it. It's Peter Pan as an adult goes back to Neverland uh, to, you know, help the kids fight against Captain Hook, uh, played by the great uh, Dustin Hoffman, um, and against Smee, played by the late, uh, great Bob Hoskins. So Hook for me was just, you know, I don't know, it was a great movie, and it just introduced me to this man and his his comedy and, you know, used to the way he looked and how goofy he was and how fun he was as an actor and a comedian. I think it was that and Aladdin, you know, yeah, Aladdin, Aladdin, obviously, yeah. we didn't get to see him in Aladdin, but we got to, his presence is throughout that entire movie, and he's one of the parts that I think a lot of us loved that movie as a kid. Yeah, so, I mean, it was just, you know, it was great to, to see him kind of, I know he'd already been famous before I got, you know, before I got a hold of him in, in my day, but it was great to see him move on and do stuff like Toys. Mrs. Doubtfire was a big, big movie for our generation. As funny as the man was, just his impeccable comedic timing, my favorite films are always the ones where he played it straight, where he was a, just a, an honest character. Like, even when he was playing, like, obviously for me, Goodwill Hunting in 1996. Yes. I believe it was 96. 90, 97. 97? Okay. Uh, yeah. Just fantastic. And even he's playing the, the therapist that Matt Damon has to go and, you know, talk to you for his, you know, the court ordered stuff he still sneaks that little robin williams sense of humor in there that just mm-hmm. only robin williams could deliver but just the power that's, of yeah that's his best not role. your right. fault that those those words right there yep i can't watch that without getting emotional and now more so now that he is not no longer with us makes it just hurt a little bit more yeah, yeah that was probably is i mean you look at his career unlike chris farley his career lasted like six years Robin Williams' career started in 1977, went all the way to his death, uh, even after, in 2015, uh, he, had, he had voiced a movie with Simon Pegg where he played the voice of a dog or whatever. So, like, he, you know, his legacy has reached several generations, I think, which I think is great to have that kind of uh, pull as, a, as an actor, as a comedian. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, just any role that he stepped in, even if he was another one of those actors, even if the movie was bad, you still watched it just to see him do his thing. Cause when he, he popped up in uh, nine months with Hugh Grant as the doctor. I, mean, I, love, I love that movie. <laughs> and that's the thing about him is like, okay, I'm going to jump real quick to his TV stuff. Yeah. Like he, he was a huge, big actor, big Hollywood actor, made lots of money, would never, um, not come to a TV show if they asked him. He did an episode of Law and Order SVU when he was still super famous. It was before he was kind of doing a lot of indie films, and he was like, "Robin Williams is on Law and Order." Like, wait, what? Like, why is he doing Law and Order SVU? That's for actors that don't do anything anymore. And it was and a great role. It was it was kind of like a very one hour photo type role. I think I might have even been around when that movie came out. When he was on his, he had the CBS show, The Crazy Ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he tried so hard to carry that show, and yeah, nobody else was really memorable, or you know, not to offend anyone, worth a damn on that. Yeah, and you know, finding out why he had to take such so many of these roles and just his personal life, and you know, people that have taken advantage of him, and like so many beloved comedians and actors, just the amount of time that he gives, just two people. Like, there are so many stories about Robin Williams where he meets somebody in a diner and cheers him up or just, you know, spending time with sick children or the things that he did for Make-A-Wish and mm-hmm. just just an amazing human being. And, you know, when we found out in 2014 that he was no longer with us, just earth-shattering devastation for me. I mean, I've never met the man or anything like that, but he is such an important part of my life that... Mm-hmm. I do feel like someone close to me was gone. It, when you watch these these guys growing up, guys and girls growing up, you know you feel um, like a part of their world almost, or you know at least that they're a part of yours. So when you lose them, it it's not like losing a family member, but it's it gets some some instances it gets close. You know, it's like yep. it, I can honestly say that I've never like cried over a celebrity dying, but I've been sad over them dying. As we talked last year, I. 
or last, as we talked last week about Chris Farley, you know, that, that really hit me and it still hits me to this day. And this one as well, when I see a movie <laughs> with Robin Williams and it's just like, man, like he was just so talented. It's like, if he could just, could have just gotten past his demons. I mean, there's the rumor that he did find out that he had Parkinson's. I can't, I, it's not a hundred percent confirmed. Um, but cause it wasn't listed like on his autopsy or not, but his wife said right. that he found out he had Parkinson's and that was somewhat possibly what led to him taking his own life, which you know, if anyone's ever feeling suicidal thoughts, whatever, go get help, please. Yes. Uh, this is, you know, it was a sad moment in film and TV and comedy history. When this happened, uh, you just felt a big blow, I think. And it was just crushing, you know, as, as a fan of, of these people, um, and just, again, it brings to light the realization that just because you have lots of money, just because you're successful, just because people like you doesn't mean your life is actually going great. Exactly. Um, and it, again, you know, people always say money doesn't buy you happiness. And it looks like a lot of times it looks like that's true because there are a lot of people that are well off that can't handle it or are depressed and have the same people forget that just because they're celebrities doesn't make them different than us. They have emotions, they have feelings. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, you know, they get angry, they get depressed, they get sad, just like everybody else. One fleet decision in their life can change just like, our, just like you or me. Anything can happen. It's um, like Biggie Small said, more money, more problems. Exactly. <laughs> Which is very, very well maybe true. Um, As we come to a close or near the end of our Robin Williams segment, one of my just high, favorite just moments of just recently um, – on Instagram, they have these little things where you hold up something like mm-hmm. or it's like a face augmented reality yeah. thing. And mm-hmm. they did a uh, Disney one where it's, which Disney character are you? And uh, Zelda Williams, Robin's daughter, posted a video of her doing that, and it actually ended up getting Genie. Yes, and it was just a real touching little thing, and it's of no big consequence. But just seeing that's like, oh, yeah. Well, and it gave me the feels. One more touching tribute, I think, too, was in the uh, first Jumanji sequel with The Rock and Kevin Hart. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Jonas brother, I think it's Nick Jonas, um, who is one of the characters in the movie that's been, he's been in, stuck in Jumanji for like 20 years. Right. They have that touching tribute, and it, and Jonas says, he goes, this is Alan Parrish's house, I'm just living in it. Uh, right. And it's a great line throwback to robin williams he it passed two years before that movie came out i'm pretty sure they obviously threw that in because of that um and just the way that it sounds like this is a fitting tribute i think to a man who just always as we talked about chris friday last week just always tried to make everybody happy was right. disappointed when he went into a room and people weren't laughing and people weren't smiling and wanted them even if he wasn't happy at the moment wanted them to be happy and I think right. that was what really made endeared everybody to him and why everybody missed him and felt it when he passed. Yeah, well, just the way Billy Crystal, you know, he was very close with Billy Crystal and Whoopi Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Just the way they talked about it was just, you just knew that he was a man of character. Yes, yes. So, Robin Williams, we miss you. Rest in peace. Um, we are going to move on to our next and last segment of this show uh, where we talk about things we've been watching and recommendations. Well, I'm going to jump in right here. I don't know if you guys haven't seen it yet, but the trailer for Bill and Ted 3, drop, another one dropped, and I'm excited. I, I know that... You're excited. Kind of I'm excited. <laughs> Some people are kind of like, ah, oh, kind of looks stupid. I'm like, shut your mace. For mace? I don't know where I was Whatever. Talking. Shut whatever you're opening and be quiet. How dare you? And just be happy that we have a Bill and Ted movie... In the year 2020, which is the worst year on record, I think. If you just go look in the history books, it's pretty terrible. I'm, I'm, other stuff has happened, but 2020 has been pretty bad. Um, that's obviously sarcasm if people didn't catch that. Um, but yeah. Definitely the worst year. Well, no, I can't even say the worst year of the century, but it's pretty dang bad. It's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, Bill and Ted Face the Music is coming out. That We'll start with that. Uh they announced that they are going to release it on September 1st. It'll be in theaters and on demand at the, on the same day, uh, which will be awesome. I'm looking forward to watching it. JT, a friend of ours who used to work with us at Feld, pointed out that and a great thing in the trailer is that he's like, I love that their daughters are stupid. And I love that too. Like just that one little part in the yes. trailer where like, how was your day? Well, we died. Yeah, but how was your day? Like it was just like. 
just so perfect. And they, it seems like they nailed the part. Um, I love Samara Weaving, who is an actress I've talked about on social media a lot. She's in mm-hmm. a lot of like good horror films, and I'm glad that people are going to get to see her in something with you know that's got this much of a following because she really deserves it, and it, it looks good. And that's definitely that's a recommendation, even though we haven't seen it yet. Watch Bill and Ted when it comes out because it's going to be something that we need in 2020. I think. Uh, yes. Be excellent to each other. Party on, dudes. Party on, dudes. So and it's fun. Oh, sorry, as we get into stuff that I've watched this week. It's funny because, you know, you know me, Wayne, like I watch a lot of movies and TV shows and stuff like this week. I was like, man, I didn't really watch that much. And then I'm sure as you noticed yesterday, as I was tagging you in all my posts, I watched quite a bit of stuff. I really didn't, I guess, (laughs) like (laughs) it was a slow day for you. It was a slow day for me, I guess. A slow week for me. Um, It was a busy work week. Yes. Like I was just, I'm like, wait a minute. I did watch a lot of stuff. Uh, Warrior Nun, new show on Netflix. I talked about it before I finally finished it. Great show. Watch it if you haven't seen it. Uh, Needful Things, an old Stephen King movie. Don't watch it. Not that good. Max von Sydow, very good in it, though. Showbiz Kids. I want people to watch this. It's a movie on HBO. It's a documentary, hour and a half, directed by Alex Winter, star of Bill and Ted. Uh, No way! Plays Bill. He's made his work in documentaries in the last uh, 20 plus years. Um, and this is another one. He was a showbiz kid, so he interviews a lot of other showbiz kids, current and uh, old. Um, Evan Rachel Wood, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, Henry Thomas, uh, the late um, Cameron Boyce, who just passed away. He was only 20 years old. He had a seizure. Uh, yep. they, they even give a nice shout-out to him at the end. Um, just a lot of you know, blasts from the past. Will Wheaton is in it. They talk about River Phoenix, who will be a segment on – gone but not forgotten at some point mm-hmm. um and you know it's just it's just good it's just a good documentary if you're a movie buff watch it because it kind of takes you back a little bit into some of those actors where um, can i find that uh, it's on hbo hbo max HBO. or hbo um which they are getting rid of hbo go at the end of the month it'll just be hbo max from this point on and it will be it was showbiz kids showbiz kids yes i'm definitely gonna make sure i see that this week yeah it's really good uh, next, we'll get into uh, two David Spade Netflix originals. Fa- ah, yes. <laughs> Father of the Be- Year and The Wrong Missy, both directed by Tyler Spindell. As I po- if you saw what I posted, they're really dumb. They are super duper dumb movies, but they're funny. And now, comedy movies, I've always said this as a viewer of comedy, it's simple. You got to make me laugh. I don't mm-hmm. always care about the story. A lot of people will even take. Oh, well, you know, uh, Biodome didn't have that great of a story. It's like, were you watching Biodome for a story? I'm sorry. Like, come on. I get why people may not like them. I feel like comedies and horror films are like, while they're, to me, they're the most easy to enjoy, they're mm-hmm. really hard to make because you got to scare people in horror films and you got to make people laugh in comedies. Those are two things that are really hard to do, I feel. So when you do it successfully, you should be proud of yourselves. And like I said, that mo- those movies, they're not for everybody, but they're funny, they're dumb, and they're on Netflix. I have a loyalty to David Spade where I just have to watch anything he does just because... I do too. I don't know what it is like because most of his movies aren't good, but it, they're funny. Joe Dirt is funny. It's yes. stupid, but it's funny. I mean, the fact that he's not going to portray Tiger King really, really upsets me. It is disappointing. We may get it eventually. There may be another kind of spoof type movie that that happens. I feel like we'll we'll get... All I have to say is Nicolas Cage better bring his A game. Oh, yeah. He's going to cage that up real good. I'll tell you. That's what I'm worried about. (laughs) And I mean, I like Nick Cage. I do, but not in this particular character role. I don't think it's going to (laughs) work. We'll see. It'll it'll be something to behold for sure. Whether it's good or bad, it'll be something to behold. Um, Father of the Year, I was not as big a fan of, but I really enjoyed The Wrong Missy. Yes, yes. Wrong Missy. Lauren Lapkus is the the all-star of The Wrong Missy, Absolutely. as David Spade is kind of the straight character. She's really good. She's hilarious. Uh, everything she does in that movie is just really funny, and I really recommend yeah. it, just for her alone. Just to see I a, enjoyed. Yeah, I enjoyed her on The Big Bang Theory. Yes, she was good on that as well. Just to see a female comedian actress like do her thing, you should watch yep. that movie because she does a lot in that movie that you know usually is reserved for the male character. And I yep. think you know a lot of physical humor. So then next, I watched Skin, which is a movie about neo Nazis. Uh, neo Nazis are bad. If people don't know that, you should. Uh, racism also bad. 
uh, newsflash. It stars Jamie Bell, who has played Billy Elliot. He's in a lot of other movies. He's really good in it. The movie itself is is good, but not great. Um, no American History X, but it's about a guy, a true story about a guy who um, decides he doesn't want to be a neo Nazi anymore and hurt people and kill, you know, be a, an accomplice to murder. It's on Amazon Prime if you haven't gotten if you got a chance to see it. Then the next two I'm going to talk about from 1988, The Blob and Mississippi Burning, two completely different movies. The Blob is a horror film. It's a lot of fun. Love, love it. It's a great remake. Watch it. Mm-hmm. Rent it or buy it. Mississippi Burning is a movie that is basically feels like it could be today. It's about uh, yeah. police and KKK in Mississippi in 1964 killing three civil rights workers. And then uh, Gene Hackman and Willem Dafoe go there to kind of solve the murder and feel and figure out what happened and it kind of has i wouldn't say a happy ending but it, it resolves itself at least a little bit and you look up the story in real life and it's pretty crazy um that when you rent or buy i watched my own copy of that i watched it man which is a story of bruce the guy who trained bruce lee i feel like that's kind of like very easy way to talk about the movie because it doesn't really explain anything about him there's more to it obviously than that he you know it starts out with him in China right before Japan uh, attacked during World War II, and then it takes place, then it breaks, and then it comes back, and then Japan has taken over China, uh, so he has to deal with that. But lots of great kung fu sequences. The action sequences are beautiful. Donnie Yang does a great job with this movie. Uh, there's four of them. They're all on Netflix. I'm working my way through them. Uh, In the Dark TV show season two just came out. I watched that. We watched that last weekend. Really good show about a blind girl whose best friend gets murdered and she tries to solve the murder herself because the cops won't take her seriously. The Pool, movie on Shudder, miss it, not that good. The Room, a lot of movies have Room in the title. It's not The Room everyone's thinking about. <laughs> it's from 2019, stars Olga Kirilenko. Uh, it's a movie about like a magical room that you, when you wish about, for when you're in the room and you say you want something, it appears. But there's obviously a catch. There's always a catch in those movies. I like this movie because I thought it was like a ghost story movie about a haunted room, but it's really like kind of like almost sci-fi-ish, I guess, in a way, or magical, genie-ish, whatever you want to call it. Um, I liked it. It was it, The ending could have been better, but the movie itself was good. That one's on Shudder, if you have Shudder, and so is The Pool, but again, don't watch The Pool. Uh, <laughs> I rewatched Real Steel. Um, is it Great well, movie. Yes, there's a movie that when it came out, I didn't think it was going to be any good. Didn't really yep. give it a... Didn't give it a thought. When I saw it, I was surprised. I liked it. I liked it. Back Rocky with robots. What else do you need? Exactly. It, like I said, I posted online. It's over the top meets Rocky IV. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. And, then, and then I say Rocky IV because the bad guy, the girl who owns the, the main robot is Russian. So I think that's where that tie-in comes in. Obviously, it was probably on purpose. Um, really enjoyable movie. I don't know if it's streaming right now, but you could rent or buy it anywhere. Really good. Um, then I was able to watch Fear City, New York versus the Mafia. It's a new... Did you finish it? Yes, I did. Did you start it yet? I'm only on episode two. I wanted to get into that. It's very, very good. It is good. I will, that's all I'll say about it. It's very good. If you like that kind of stuff, uh, organized crime stuff, it's really good. Um, it's only three episodes. It's a real quick watch yeah. on Netflix. Now, watching that made me go, you know what? We talked about mob films a couple weeks ago. I'm going to re-watch Black Mass with Johnny Depp, which is about yeah. Whitey Bulger and it actually is very interesting because you watch Black Mass and they talk about the RICO Act happening mm-hmm. at the time that Black Mass is happening. So it's an interesting kind of, uh, um, what do you call that? Like a um, double, it's an interesting double lineup to watch. You go yep. you watch Fear City, Mafia, uh, New York versus the Mafia, and then watch Black Mass. You kind of get a sense of the times a little bit and what yeah, was happening. I need to revisit Black Mass as well because the first time I watched it, I wasn't. A it, huge fan. And that's what I'm going to say about it. Like, Black Mass was a movie I expected to love. I only came out liking it. Like, it was... Yeah. And the second time around, still the same. But Johnny Depp is freaking masterful in this movie. Yes. He, he plays it... And I posted this in my comments online. He plays it like a serial killer. Like, you... Like, there's those moments in mob movies where you know, like, the guy goes up to the girl of the wife of another friend. And you know they're going to, like, make out or have sex or whatever. No. Johnny Depp in this movie, if he goes up to your wife, you better be terrified because he's threatening her. (laughs) There's another character that you're like, oh, something's going to happen here. He chokes her to death. Like, uh, Whitey Whitey Bulger was not a nice man. He was very evil, and they play it as such. And I think think that 
rub some people the wrong way because he was he's not likable and he's not supposed to be. So anyone, one of the complaints I read was like, well, he wasn't very likable. I didn't care for it. It's like, he wasn't likable. You're not he was, supposed to like He him. was feared even because people think, I think because people think that he gave back to the community. Like people in Boston respected him. I don't think they respected him as much as they feared him and didn't want to die. And right. I think they handled that really well. The one thing that, the biggest thing that bothered me about this movie was we didn't get enough of him. A lot of it was, he's great in it. He's obviously the main character, but there's a lot about a lot of backstory about the other guys in 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 this whole group here, and why they feared him and why he was such a, a scary person, um, which is great backstory. But it's like at the end, I'm like, I want more Johnny Depp. Like I came to see, I wa- came to watch this movie because of Johnny Depp, uh, and it does have a great supporting cast. I'm not going to roll through it. Look it up. It's got like everybody yeah. you've ever known as an actor in it. Just yeah, good movie, not great, good. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I watched this week. A little, a little less than usual, even though I'm sure people are like, "What the hell?" <laughs> yes, you brought up a time. Uh, you brought up Mississippi Burning, which is funny because I watched A Time to Kill this week. Oh, two movies that really go hand in hand. Yes, a Time to Kill is 1996 with uh, uh, a young Matthew McConaughey. He had yes. done some things. Um, yeah, he's a few a car, some car commercials. I mean, up to this point, 96, he had done a few things. I mean. Angels in the Outfield, hello. <laughs> uh, uh, hold on. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Thank you uh, very much. Yes, yes, yes. A little dazed, a little confused. Yes, all yes, right, that right, too. All, yep. right. all right, all uh, right, but, all yeah, right. Um, this is a, uh, takes place in Canton, Mississippi. A fearless young lawyer and his assistant defend a black man accused of murdering two white men who raped his 10-year-old daughter. Uh, stars Matthew McConaughey as the lawyer. Sandra Bullock as his assistant. Samuel L. Jackson as the revenge-seeking father. Uh, Kevin Spacey is the uh, the DA, the district attorney. You've got Oliver Platt, Charles S. Dutton. Love our Oliver Platt. Donald Sutherland as Lucian Wilbank. Uh, also, Kiefer Sutherland, one of the few times, father and son. Yep, and he plays the, the like new leader of the KKK in that town. Yes. Um. Obviously, the biggest thing you take away from this movie is uh, Matthew McConaughey's uh, closing arguments. Yeah. It's a little bit of what we need right now. It's, yeah, it's you know... It really is. He explains everything and then just ends it with... And uh, Do you care if I spoil it? I mean, it's been out for... Go for it. It's ends so it with, imagine she... Now, now imagine that she's white. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's what it takes for people... To get it into perspective sometimes. And it's stupid that it takes that. But it, we're, the world we're living in today, it's obvious that it takes that. The people have and to the imagine problem these that people. even if you spell it out for them, they still refuse to yeah. accept it. It's Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a very, a very frustrating very, trying time. Yeah, a very timely movie for that was made over 20 years ago. Um, and it isn't based on a true story. It's based on, a, I believe, a John Grissom novel. But uh, obviously, right. he was tapping into something real and something that was happening in that book. Um it's, but yeah, also, good movie. Yes, fantastic. I just thought that it was uh, it was unique that we both watched something without yeah. talking about it. And, um, obviously, uh, I also start. I'm in the middle of Fear City, New York versus the Mob. You know, fantastic. I am still working my way through The Sopranos. <laughs> I am at the end of season five, and uh, we are working our way through Lucifer. We're halfway through season three. Season three of Lucifer, obviously, my as I said before, my favorite. Uh, some of Tom Welling's f- finest work. Um, Big Bang Theory to go to bed. And that's what I've been watching. Oh, I also started um, The Last Dance, the Chicago Bulls 10-part nice. series. Uh, it's anything that a sh- sports fan, but most importantly, you know, I was a couple of Chicago kids. Just, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, good as, stuff. As soon as you're done with that, we'll, we'll have a conversation on that because I, I thought it was fantastic. All right. And you just got to feel for Scotty Pippen in that situation. You do. You do. Yeah. 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 And I hope he yeah. knows that, like, as you will see, too, because it's come out that, like, he he thinks it makes him look bad to people. Like, we don't think you like that, Scotty. We no. still love and respect you, and we understand you went through a lot. Uh, it was – it was yeah, he was a great player, and I always have respect for him for, the, for those uh, championships, obviously. Yep. Um, all right. So – Outside of the movies I already mentioned that I want to recommend, there's, instead of switching up this week, instead of doing like a streaming service, I'm going to recommend the movies of an actress. 
And I think it's an actress that people loathe or hate. And it's because she was in a franchise that people loathe and hate. Uh, and the actress is Kristen Stewart. And people, anytime they hear her name, and Robert Pattinson's too, they think Twilight. Well, I'll have you know, Twilight was 13 years ago, the first movie. Now, the, of course, the, the last one was like 2011 or 12 or whatever. whatever. But still, either way, it's a long time. Mm-hmm. Kristen Stewart has done a lot of work in the last... 10 plus years, the last 20 plus years, let's be actually just take Kristen Stewart has done a lot of work in the last 20 years that people need to watch and see and people ignore it because of the movies that she's been in. So I'm going to just go through, if you can find these movies anywhere, obviously, you know what? Google is your friend in this, in this scenario. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start with Panic Room directed by David Fincher, starring Jodie Foster and Forrest Whitaker. Great movie. Uh, Fierce People, another movie she was in, uh, another indie film, Donald Sutherland. Really good movie. You should check it out. It also has the late Anton Yelchin as the main character. Mm-hmm. Um, Zathura, kids movie, decent. Uh, Into the Wild, she's in, not a bad movie. The Runaway is another good movie. Welcome to the Rileys with James Gandolfini is a good movie. Still Waiting, The Huntsman isn't half bad. She's not great in that one. Then you get to 2014. 2014, she did the movie Clouds of Sils Maria. It's a great movie. You should definitely check it out. It's a French movie. It's in English and French. She won the French Oscar for it, but their equivalent of the Oscars for Best Actress. The only American that's ever done that is Kristen Stewart. So just to give people an idea of how good she has gotten over the years, uh, really good. Still Alice with uh, Julianne Moore, which Julianne Moore won the Oscar for. A very good movie. She's great in that. American Ultra. Uh, I was expecting it to be better, but she's still really good in it. Um, personal shopper I haven't seen yet. It's supposed to be really good. Lizzie, the story of Lizzie Borden with her and Chloe Seventy. Very good. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a what if story because it's not 100% true. It's a bit more based on rumor and myth. Very good though. Her and Chloe are great together. Um, and then Underwater, her movie from this year. Really good. Really good horror flick. I really liked it a lot. Uh, it's a mo- undersea monster movie. So if you haven't seen a good Kristen Stewart movie, check out some of the ones I mentioned because she's really good and she deserves the respect as a credible actress that I don't believe that she gets. Were you not a fan of the 2019 Charlie's Angels? I have yet to see the 2019 Charlie's Angels and I look forward to watching it actually because of her, because I'm such a huge fan of her now. I'm excited to see it. I have yet to watch it though. I do have to add uh, 2009 Adventureland to your list. I think that is a fantastic movie. Very good movie. Guys Great cast, it. too. Great cast, yeah. yeah. Anything yeah. else, Wayne, you want to talk about? No, that pretty much wraps it up. We appreciate everyone sticking around listening, and uh, we hope you had fun listening to this week. We will be back next week. Um, yeah. We have you know, yet to miss a day. So here we're going to keep on going. We hope you guys enjoy it. If you have any comments, please feel free to reach out to us. Our personal it's going accounts. to be easier to communicate with us because we are looking into launching our own website and we are going to start doing video once it's acceptable to be in the same room. Yes, exactly. We, yes, we are working on the family with. Yes, we are working on a website. We're going to start up social media accounts for our for our podcast as well. We have yet to do that, um, but all that will be done and we'll you know we'll branch out. And so until then, till next week, everyone have a great week. Uh, hope you enjoy, and we'll talk to you then. Have a good one, guys.